All right, Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to read what the Bible warns about the Roman Catholic Church at verse 6. Tonight we're continuing on our lesson. You might recall our history of the Anabaptists. The Baptist distinctives have always been carried and alive. And we like to put the Anabaptists as one of those earliest people who carried it on. Now remember the official Baptist group and that label and name did not really come out yet, even though sometimes that word was used during those times. But the first Baptist church did not come out yet. However, the Baptist distinctives, the independent fundamental Baptist or Bible-believing beliefs has been carried on ever since the beginning of the Bible till now, and I've shown that to you. I've shown you, you the nine points, the nine areas of that. We've covered their history. Now we're going to cover the martyrs at verse 6. You know that Revel uh, Revelation 17 is about the Roman Catholic Church. And the Bible describes this woman in verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So this mother church or this Roman Catholic wicked being this entity has caused so much pain and destruction to the Bible believers yeah. and shed a lot of blood. So we are now coming to a point, I've explained a lot of the martyrs and the bloody inquisition during the earlier ages of the Roman Catholic era. The, uh, the exciting stories that are more detailed, you're going to come across this time period right here, actually. So that's where the uh, more detailed stories and the more exciting stories are given, actually, is during that time. And uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs and Martyr's Mirror covered a lot of great stories. But this time period especially is very riveting that you're going to hear. Now, this is going to be very important for all of you to hear. We have to go back through our history. Now, remember this, King Henry VIII, he was ruling over England. There are two areas we've been concentrating. I don't know if you noticed this, but there are two areas that you can see as we go from world history where the Holy Spirit's moving. We went across South America, the ancient times. We even covered the Muslim areas, Asia, Asia Minor areas. But we see the Holy Spirit, how he was still carrying on, and it's about to come to two areas. One is Europe. Remember the Reformers, the Protestant Reformation. You remember those guys? So don't forget the Reformers. And the Reformers came to be because of Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation. So remember that. Now the devil cor tried to corrupt the Reformers through Calvinism, you might recall that. So Calvin was considered a reformer, and then more so his followers uh, came out to become the Calvinists. So reformers mainly come from Martin Luther himself, and then we've seen a taint and a corruption within the reformers thanks to John Calvin. However, generally, we see a lot of good stuff about the reformers if we bypass the scholars. It's always the scholars that mess everything up. Yeah. If you bypass the scholars and then uh, you try to go to those who track, who, uh, who, track, who practice Bible-believing concepts, then you can see those who are almost like us. Anabaptists are a given. And then from Europe, we go to England and we see the English reformers. The Huguenots are a, also a branch that comes out from the reformers. Now we're seeing a lot of uh, action and different people coming out thanks to what Luther did. Luther laid a foundation. There's absolutely no doubt about it and that all the people are just 
uh, planning on top of it. The best group, obviously, were the Anabaptists. Now let's see what's going on right here. So it's England and Europe. You'll notice that. Because England is no longer a part of the Holy Roman Empire. The Lord used a wicked king named King Henry VIII, where King Henry VIII thought he was all that, and then he broke off the Roman Catholic Empire, and he declared himself to be the head of the Roman Catholic Empire. Whereas uh, the Pope is supposed to be the head, right? The Pope is supposed to be the head of the Roman Catholic Empire, but King Henry VIII said, no, I'm the head. So he started what is the Anglican Church, actually. Now, if you look at Frederick Widowson's book, he mentions on page 270, and also on uh, page 279, about a little bit of that history. The Anglican Church, it's not really much different from the Catholic Church, and we're going to get down to it. So the Anglican Church is not really much different from the Catholic Church. It's just that it has that English culture, and that the King of England is the head of the church, not the Pope. William Tyndale gave a prayer when he was burnt at the stake for trying to translate the Bible into English. He cried out, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. You might recall that was his prayer. And uh, let me know if I'm out of bounds. But when he gave that prayer and cried to God, remember the King of England's eyes, King Henry VIII, somehow just saw no, uh, no good reason to prevent William Tyndale's Bible or his work yeah. from spreading. Yeah. So King Henry VIII allowed that. So now England, so notice the true trend here. Remember the Holy Roman Empire, Europe and England, okay? King Henry VIII broke it off. So now there's two areas. Because it's split off from the Holy Roman Empire, no Pope interference. Yeah. The king is supposed to be the head of England, of his Anglican church and empire. So he allowed the Bible to roam freely. When we get down to our history, that's going to be very important. He laid the foundation. A wicked king was the one yeah. that laid the foundation. That's phenomenal. That's really big. Yep. Now we're going to come to an exciting point in our history. There is no doubt that the devil, he's seeing something going on. And then so there's a lot of action taking place. The Bible believers were trying to hold the fort in Europe while the, uh, there were other Bible believers trying to hold the fort in England. And God was about to do something great. From William Tyndale's prayer, Edward took the throne after King Henry VIII. Edward also helped spread the Bible. So I don't know how many uh, Bibles that he spread out, but he started to do some work. And Edward helped that movement where the English people are able to have the Word of God in their hands. So this was really big. Now, the Roman Catholic Empire, you can imagine, they are very upset about this. The devil is upset about this. The word of God now is freely in their hands. Remember, go back to the past years, almost a thousand years. Even during the apostles' time period, they never had freedom yeah. with the scriptures. Right. This is a huge event. This is really, really big. But then you can see this collide of the Catholics versus the reformers, back and forth. And there was a battle going on. Don't forget those Jesuits, those sneaky Jesuits. The Jesuits helped out the Holy Roman Empire, and then the Catholics tried to make a comeback against England. They didn't want England to become a reformed nation, so to speak, the Reformation to effect it. So then after Edward, Bloody Mary took over. You hear that name? Bloody Mary. You know where that came from? Because she was responsible for killing a lot of Bible believers. This is a very dark time. It looked like a huge victory to the Holy Roman Empire. Because now the scriptures can be blocked. She's a diehard Catholic. Re don't forget the bloody Inquisition. So the Inquisition and its terrors and its torturous devices can be revived. Bloody Mary helped the inquisitions and the people who learn from the inquisition and the torture to continue on. The burning of the stakes was 
uh, quite often, and there was an unholy union taking place. This looked like a huge comeback for the Holy Roman Empire. Do you know who Bloody Mary uh, uh, married, <laughs> so to speak? She married Philip of Spain. Philip of Spain, this is so dangerous. Remember, Spain is a Catholic territory. Remember, the Muslims died out. I've, showed, I've explained that in your his, history part. Originally, it was mostly Muslim territory, but then the Catholics started to push them away. So Philip of Spain is a diehard Catholic. The worst Inquisition branch, remember, is the Spanish Inquisition. It is said the worst tortures and deaths and execution was under two people, Philip of Spain and the Duke of Alva. And with the Spanish Inquisition in their power, with Bloody Mary, it was a dark time. So Satan now was heading toward England and Europe, and he's, he's determined to wipe out the Bible believers off the map. With the combined force of Bloody Mary and Philip of Spain, it looked like the Holy Roman Empire, that the Vatican, the Jesuits, and the Pope would have their victory once more. I'm going to uh, read some stories over here about uh, the martyrs on how they lay down their lives for Jesus, and it was a time of terror. The Inquisition was rising up again after Luther's Reformation. When we look at our history of Bible believers, it gets us under conviction on how these people just lay down their lives for Jesus Christ and they trusted in him completely. They were willing to be tortured to death for his name. It gets you under conviction. It touches my heart. Now remember, before Philip of Spain, don't forget Emperor Charles. Emperor Charles was the guy who was in charge of the Holy Roman Empire and Luther faced him. Luther could have been tortured. Uh, the dukes that were influenced by Luther could have been tortured, but God's mighty hand was so much on him that uh, the, the emperor couldn't go against the dukes because it was so broken up the empire. He needed a unified. Luther was protected by another duke. If you might recall, uh, when I've explained about our history lesson, if I never mentioned that, Luther, the reason why he survived all that time was there was a duke who hid him, protected him in his castle so that people won't find him. So Luther, there was no doubt God's hand was on him where he changed the entire empire and almost the world and history itself. Secular historians cannot skip Martin Luther when they talk about this historical time period. That's how much he affected history. They can neglect the Baptists all they want, the secular historians, but they can't uh, reject Luther because he changed history, this guy. Let's go to this time period on how the Bible believers stood out during this reign of terror. Let's start off with Emperor Charles V and go down the track. Emperor Charles V, Dr. Upman says on page 519 in the History of the New Testament Church, issued the Edict of Spires, commanding the entire Holy Roman Empire to go on a crusade against the Baptists. This is interesting. His definition of a Baptist was anyone who neglected infant baptism. So notice that, this, uh, that, baptive, that Baptist indication was alive during that time, even though the official denomination wasn't out. Under Charlie, Dr. Upman calls him, under Charlie, Christians were hanged, beheaded, burned, or buried alive in the Netherlands. On June 10, 1535, he called for the death of every Bible believer in the land. If they recanted, they would have the privilege of dying by the sword instead of by fire. Wicked, evil man, right? Yeah, yeah. Women were buried alive. They were placed in a tight coffin, and a rope was put around their neck and drawn through two holes in the bottom of the coffin. Three iron bars were driven through the coffin from side to side to keep the struggling body under the lid. The lid was then nailed down, and dirt was shoveled over the coffin. Dr. Rule relates the case of a harmless woman at Leoward in 1548 in whose house some papist found a Latin testament. Since she didn't have written permission to be reading it, she was put on the rack for torture and then beheaded. Now, some of these torture devices you might recall that I explained in our 
previous discipleship classes. The rack is where they tie thin ropes and then they stretch you. And then those ropes would cut through the skin and the muscle and blood would squirt out five or six different directions. And then the iron coffin is a coffin simply with spikes. You put a victim in there and then you close the coffin. You can guess what would happen. And yes, it would even pierce through your eyes. One Baptist sentenced to death escaped over a frozen lake. His name was Dirk Willemzoom. One of the papist soldiers chasing him fell through the ice and began to scream for help. His two buddies deserted him, but Dirk came back and helped him out. Once out, the soldier's buddies showed up. They arrested Dirk and took him back into prison, and he was burned at the stake the next day. Did you hear that? I hope you're just not, uh, you know, letting, uh, just hearing me robotically read. I hope you're paying attention. This is a lot of good stuff, and this is probably one of the best lessons I'm going to read to you. This guy helped a soldier, okay? I don't know if you heard me. This guy helped out a soldier who was chasing after him. And then the soldier was about to die, sink in the lake, uh, in that icy lake. The, that guy rescued his life. This Anabaptist saved his life. And then what did they do in return? In return, they just caught him and killed him. He could have ran away, gone away with it. But instead, he returned to help his persecutor. Baptists met where they could hear the Bible taught in darkness, in barns, and in bushes. Dragoons hunted them by the light of the moon and the stars. Under Charles V, more than 30,000 Baptists were killed in Friesland and Holland alone. Rule says, quote, the whole land was stricken with terror and the cries of the tortured were heard perpetually. Gallows and trees on the highway were hung with dead bodies. The very air was polluted with the stench and the knell of death sounded heavily from every belfry. The Duke of Alva gloated. So remember the Duke of Alva, he's a part of that wicked mess. Uh, let's go over here. He had invented a new torture. You screwed an iron clamp on a man's tongue and then burned the end of his tongue with fire till it dropped off. When the victim screamed, the soldiers would compliment him on his fine singing. You understand that the Baptist victim is lined up with the gates of hell while the Catholic screwing the clamp on is a loyal son of Christ's church who will prevail over it. At least that is what you are to believe if you are a good Catholic. No country at this time was more thoroughly soaked with the blood of the saints than Holland under Philip II of Spain and the Duke of Alva. However, the Pope's control of France was also strong enough at this time to sponsor a good bloodbath there. This one was called, this was a pretty famous event that you want to know, St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. I kind of moved the whiteboard. Uh, hopefully it didn't uh, move, okay? St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, when we go to France, let's see here. Francis I was taken by his mother to see the Pope one day. They discussed the most important issue which any vicar of Christ could discuss, how to kill every Protestant in France. France had been an open sore on the papacy's nose ever since the Paterines, Fratricelli, Manichaeans, Albigenses, and poor men of Lyons moved in. So that's a little bit of the Waldensian uh, history or influence, right? There followed one debacle after another in the next few years, and when Francis died, he was succeeded by Henry II, whose wife was Catherine de' Medici. After one year in office, Henry II and his wife made a procession to Notre Dame, 1549 and help participate in the Catholic festivities there, which at this time highlighted the roasting of Protestants at the Place de Grave by lowering them slowly over a bonfire on a makeshift crane. Several years later, a marriage took place between Henry of Navarre, Henry IV, 
and Margaret de Val uh, Valois, Henry's mother was Jeanne de Albret, a staunch Huguenot. So remember those Huguenots I wrote down, right? Around this time, a famous Bible-believing Huguenot, Admiral de Coligny, and other distinguished guests were invited to the French king's court, including Jean de Albret, Queen of Navarre. When they had all assembled, supposedly on the best of terms, Henry of Navarre had fought on the Protestant side of the fence earlier with Coligny and the Prince de Conde. What happened? A Catholic assassin stabbed Coligny, and this sparked the Catholic revival. The cathedral bell of Saint Germain le Auxerrois tolled at 2 a.m. This is August 24th, 1572, as a pre-arranged signal for all Catholics to prevail against the gates of hell. Mesere says this. This is how it went, this massacre. The populace being warmed by the smell of blood 60,000 men armed in different ways ran, ran about wheresoever example, vengeance, rage, and the desire of plunder transported them. The air resounded with a horrible tempest of blasphemies and oaths of the murderers, of the firing of pistols and guns, of the pitiable cries of the dying, of the lamentations of the women whom they dragged by the hair, with furious expressions, kill, stab, throw them out the window. Some were shot on the roofs of houses. Others were cast out of windows. Some were cast into the water and knocked on the head with blows of iron bars or clubs. Some were killed in their beds. Some in the garrets. Other in cellars. Wives in the arms of their husbands. Husbands on the bosoms of their wives. Sons at the feet of fathers. They neither spared the aged, not women great with child, nor even infants. A man was seen to stab one of them who was playing with the beard of its murderer. The streets were paved with the bodies of the dead or the dying. There were heaps of them in the squares. The streams were filled with blood. In three days, 6,000 houses were repeatedly pillaged and more than 4,000 people were massacred in Paris alone. Another 6,000 were killed in other cities. And altogether, you know how many died in less than 40 days? 50,000. Now, how do you suppose that a Holy Father who was a vicar of Christ from Blessed Simon Peter would react to such news? How did His Holiness, Pope Gregory XIII, receive such tidings? Did he go into St. Peter's and ask God to forgive his church members for carrying on like a bunch of psychotic killers? No. Did he kneel at the altar and pray for the poor souls in purgatory who may have gone there after getting murdered? No, no, of course not. He did exactly what any student of church history would expect a really holy pope to do. He marched straight to the church of St. Mark, taking his cardinals with him, and there he solemnly gave thanks to God for the great blessing he had just conferred on the Christian world. Then he had fireworks discharged to celebrate it as a triumph of the church militant. That is evil. That is purely evil. This is a church that you love. This is the mother holy, holy church that you love. It's evil. Yeah. Purely evil. Yep. Amen. You know what some idiotic 20th century Catholics explain this perverted lunacy, Dr. Ruckman says? Easy. They say, while the suffering of the Huguenots is to be regretted, Catholics were subjected to more severe persecution in some Protestant countries. Dr. Upman says, more severe? In what countries? But even more hilarious, quote, the Pope, relying on the report which first reached him, believed that the royal family and the Catholic leaders had been saved only by the timely discovery and punishment of conspirators. End of quote. What conspirators? Whose report? According to Catholic killers in the 20th century, the whole affair was an accident 
and the church had nothing to do with it. It was just a personal political crime of an ambitious woman. Rome never changes, she just adjusts. That's right. That's it. Let's see here. Promptly thousands of Bible-believing Reformed and Huguenot Christians, I'm now in 523, page 523. Thousands of Bible-believing Reformed and Huguenot Christians evacuated France for Holland, America, England, and Germany. They took their money, libraries, fine arts, manufacturing skills, and industry with them, almost catap uh, catapulting France back into the Dark Ages. This time, France lost the flower of her manhood and was so denuded of high moral standards, ethical principles, and biblical knowledge that she came under the dominion of a genuine fascist dictator from 1638 to 1715, under Roman Catholic Louis XIV, who set up France for atheism and eventually for the revolution. We will come back there one day. So that's what happened to France because of such a horrendous thing that resulted. In 1524, in Neldon, France, one John Clerk affixed a bill to the church door in which he called the Pope Antichrist. For this, he was repeatedly whipped and then branded on the forehead. His mother, who was watching the whole thing, cried out, Blessed be Christ and welcome these marks for his sake. When the incorrigible John Clark survived this torment, he went straight to Metz in Lorraine and smashed up some Catholic images. <laughs> For this he had his right hand and his nose cut off, his arms and breast torn with pincers, and then he was burned at the stake. Sixty Christians were slaughtered, and 250 were wounded in February of 1562 when the Duke of Guise, which is in Joinville, France, took 200 armed men to the village of Vassy. He met the Huguenots there, in the middle of a church service, about 1,200 of them, and you can guess, armed men rushed into the church with drawn swords, killing women, men, women, and children. Those who endeavored to get out the doors were murdered by soldiers outside. Others with their guns fired at the people in the gallery who broke open the roof, jumped down over the city wall, and fled into the woods some of them being wounded in flight by shots and others being stabbed or cut in their heads by swords. Obviously, they had been engaged in a conspiracy and the killing was just the work of one man or woman. The preacher, Mr. Morell, remained in the pulpit throughout that whole time. They arrested him and let a mob of papists curse him and spit on him after calling his pulpit Bible Huguenot book. <laughs> in England, the Catholics, now let's go to England. In England, the Catholics burned Anne Askew and Joanne Boucher at the stake. Anne was arrested and thrown into the Tower of London for not attending Mass. Then she was put to the rack. Bishop Gardiner and Chancellor uh, Riothesley uh, could not obtain a lying confession from her under torture. And when they ordered the torturer, whose name is Sir Anthony Knevet, the lieutenant of the tower, to increase the torture, he refused, actually. Whereupon Chancellor Riothesley, being a faithful son of the true church that Christ founded, threw off his robes and turned the rack so severely he nearly tore Anne's body in pieces. Anne still refused to lie. When asked about the cannibalism in the Mass, she said simply, quote, I have read that God made man, but that man can make God I have never read. She was so badly maimed from the racking, she had to be carried to the stake in a chair to be burned. 1546, at the ripe old age of 25. Joanne Boucher had been busy circulating Tyndale's heretical translation when she was arrested. Wow. 
May 1549. She was condemned immediately as a terrible heretic because she denied that Mary was sinless. A number of ecclesiastical worthies tried to get Joanne off the hook, but still she was burned on May 2nd, 1550. A certain Bishop Scory preached at her while she was burning and vilified her as she suffered. No one remembers to this day what the bishop's text was. <laughs> so no one knew what that Catholic, uh, that Anglican or that bishop was preaching at her, but they remembered what she said. But Joanne's reply to him in the flames will long be remembered, for it constitutes one of the most potent sermons ever preached to an apostate in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> while burning, Joanne Bosher looked the Catholic rascal dead in the eye and said, you lie like a rogue. Go read the scriptures. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman rants, goes on a rant now against the bride of Satan right here, which I won't read. I'm sure you all enjoy that, but he called them like, uh, he called them a lot of names over here. <laughs> Let's just say, but uh, it's uh, really, really good stuff. These uh, martyrs, they truly lay down their lives for Jesus. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, that, part that particular chapter covering Bloody Mary, there's a lot of good stories right there, actually, about the English reformers, how they died. You heard a couple, right? Those are really good stories. Here's a couple other ones. Uh, this is from uh, Frederick Widowson's book, page 279 on the martyrs. He says here, in England, Ralph Allerton was burned at the stake in 50, 1557. And because he had no ink in prison, you know what he did? He wrote in his own blood, stating that he believed the scripture to be true and would rather give his life than to deny any part. He used the ink in his own, uh, he used his own blood as the ink. In 1556, John Cavell was burnt at the stake for arguing against a preacher who said the Bible was an error. Oh, that sounds like today's modern textual critics, right? Yeah. When, we, when we go against them on that one. So during that time, there were martyrs laying down their lives for Jesus Christ. There is one that I want to read from Fox's Book of Martyrs. And this is about uh, Latimer and Ridley. Okay. You remember that song? Yeah. All right. So th it's uh, real good stuff right here. So uh, there's a man who was respected by the city. His name was uh, Dr. Ridley. A lot of people respected him. He was a scholar. He was a great man. And then there was a person named Latimer who was uh, uh, from a wealthy background that time. He was known as Master Latimer. Here's uh, one of the stories how they went. Then they were arrested and obviously they were uh, forced to deny Christ, but they would not. They would not give in to that Catholic heresy. And this is, uh, let's see, here's one quote. Then the smith took a chain of iron and brought the same about both Dr. Ridley's and Master Latimer's middle. And as he was knocking in a staple, Dr. Ridley took the chain in his hand and shake the same, for it did gird in his belly, and looking aside to the smith said, Good fellow, knock it in hard, for the flesh will have his course. <laughs> then his brother did bring him gunpowder in a bag and would have tied the same about his neck. So I don't know if you uh, knew this or recall what I mentioned about martyrs a long time ago. It was a sign of mercy if you burned at the stake that you put gunpowder around the neck so that the flame can catch the gunpowder and his head can blow off. <laughs> that was mercy, actually. Some of them, if they confessed their sin and renounced their Christian stance, then they would, out of mercy, the stinking priest would 
put the gunpowder around their neck and let their heads blow up. Let's see right here. Master Ridley asked what it was, you know, that gunpowder. His brother said, gunpowder. This is what Master Ridley replied. Then, said he, I will take it to be sent of God, therefore I will receive it as sent of him. And have you any, said he, for my brother, meaning uh, Master Latimer? Yea, sir, that I have, quoth his brother. Then give it unto him, said he. Be time, lest he come too late. So his brother went and carried off the same gunpowder unto Master Latimer. In the meantime, Dr. Ridley spake unto my Lord Williams and said, My Lord, I must be a suitor unto your lordship in the behalf of divers poor men, and especially in the cause of my poor sister. I have made a supplication to the Queen's Majesty in their behalfs. I beseech your lordship for Christ's sake to be a mean to our grace for them. And then he gives a request, obviously, for that. But what happened after that, his request, then they brought, uh, you know, kindling stick, right? It's another word, but a bunch of left-wingers might be upset what that word is, actually. <laughs> then they brought uh, beep, kindled with fire, and laid the same down at Dr. Ridley's feet. To whom Master Latimer spake in this matter, manner. You know what he said when they, put the, when they were about to light the fire at the feet? Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Yeah. And so the fire being given unto them, when Dr. Ridley saw the fire flaming up towards him, he cried with a wonderful loud voice. This looks like Latin. And after this repeated this latter part often in English, Lord, Lord, receive my spirit. Master Latimer crying as vehemently on the other side, O oh, Father of heaven, receive my soul. So here are two brothers yeah. wow. dying for the Lord together. He cried on the other side. It's like one guy shouting amen during a blowout and the other guy shouting hallelujah the other side. Master Latimer crying as vehemently on the other side, O Father of heaven, receive my soul, who received the flame as it were embracing of it. After that, he had stroked his face with his hands, and as it were bathed them a little in the fire, he soon died, as it appeareth, with very little pain or none. And thus much concerning the end of this old and blessed servant of God, Master Latimer, for whose laborious, uh, laborious travails, fruitful life, and constant death, the whole realm hath caused to give great thanks to Almighty God. But Master Ridley, by reason of the evil making of the fire unto him, because the wooden beep were laid about the gorse and over high built, the fire burned first beneath, being kept down by the wood, which when he felt he desired them for Christ's sake, to let the fire come unto him, so the fire wouldn't reach him. Which when his brother-in-law heard, but not well understood, intending to rid him out of his pain, uh, let's see, as one in such sorrow, not well advised what he did, heaped more of the kindling sticks upon him, so that he can clean, covered him, which made the fire more vehement beneath, that it burned cleaned all his nether parts, before it touched the upper, and that made him leap up and down under the kindling snakes and often desire them to let the fire come unto him, saying, I cannot burn. Which indeed appeared well, for after his legs were consumed by reason of his struggling through the pain, he showed that sigh toward us clean, shirt and all untouched with flame. Yet in all this torment, he forgot not to call unto God still, having in his mouth, Lord, have mercy upon me. Let the fire come unto me. I cannot burn. In which pangs he labored till one of the standers by with his bill pulled off the kindling sticks above and where he saw the fire flame up, he rested himself unto that side. And when the flame touched the gunpowder, he was seen to stir no more, but burned on the other side, falling down at Master Latimer's feet, which some said happened by reason that the chain loosed, 
Others said that he fell over the chain by reason of the poise of his body and the weakness of the nether limbs. Some said that before he was like to fall from the stake, he desired them to hold him to it with their bills. However, it was surely it moved hundreds to tears in beholding the horrible sight. For I think there was none that had not clean exiled all humanity and mercy which would not have lamented to behold the fury of the fire so to rage upon their bodies. Signs there were of sorrow on every side. Some took it grievously to see their deaths, whose lives they held full dear. Some pitied their persons that thought their souls had no need thereof. His brother moved many men, seeing his miserable case. Some cried out of the fortune to see his endeavor. But whoso considereth their uh, preferments in the time past, the places of honor that they sometime occupied in this commonwealth, the favor they were in their, with their princes and the opinion of learning they had in the university where they studied could not choose but sorrow with tears to see so great dignity, honor, and estimation so necessary members sometime accounted so many godly virtues. The study of so many years, such excellent learning to be put into the fire and consumed in one moment. Well... Dead they are, and the reward of this world they have already. What reward remaineth for them in heaven? The day of the Lord's glory, when he cometh with his saints, shall shortly, I trust, declare. That's why that song is used in one of our hymns about Latimer and Ridley will be cheering. Why? Because that is an evil church. That is an evil church. He had to burn several times, actually. There was one person, I think it's the same, uh, the same martyr that I read, but his arm, uh, the fire wouldn't reach him, that his arm fell out and then water and blush gushed out from the other arm from his fingertips because the fire could not put him out, uh, the fire could not burn him completely. You read Fox's Book of Martyr on that chapter on Bloody Mary, there's a woman named Mrs. Press. And then Mrs. Press, uh, she was forced by her family to just uh, reject her Bible-believing beliefs, but she would not uh, give in to the Catholic Church, even though the priest forced the family onto her and they tried to get onto her. You know what? She knew more scripture than them, and they couldn't, those Catholic scholars could not stand that. They used the family against her, and that grieved her heart. But you know what? She, she gave a famous statement. She said that... Uh, That, uh, what did she say? She basically said this, is that she gave up her husband, her children, and then sister, brother, everything for the Lord. For what? For the Lord. And then she said, my God, to me, my God is my brother, my sister, my husband, my children, my whole family. That's what she said. And she died for the Lord Jesus Christ. There was another person who was a blind man, another person who was a lame man, and they got burned at the stake. And you know what uh, the lame man said? Uh, the lame man said, be of good cheer, my brother. Pretty soon we'll be up there. You'll be cured of your blindness and me of my lameness. <laughs> they had great victory. This is martyrs. During Fox's Book of Martyrs, Bloody Mary fell away, finally. Queen Elizabeth came to the scene. Under Queen Elizabeth, it became a Protestant nation again once more. If uh, Frederick Widowson, I would highly recommend to read David W. Daniel's book, Did the Catholic Church Really Give Us the Bible? It gives that drama even better. I give a little bit of that in my video, History of Bible Believers. But in Frederick Widowson's book, on page 270, Elizabeth uh, took over, and then she returned England to Protestantism. But the Catholics are not happy about it. So then they wanted uh, England to fall on its knees. So then, in Scotland, they went to Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, would be used where they can be able to uh, get the Qu Queen Elizabeth to fall. And that way they can ha hatch a plan where the Catholics can take over again. However, what happened to uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, when she tried to fight against Elizabeth, she failed. So then the Catholics lost their battle. They couldn't use Mary, Queen of Scots against Queen Elizabeth. 
So then let's go back to Philip, that powerful emperor. His boasted Spanish Armada, the most powerful fleet in the world that time. And the Spanish Armada, the Catholics were about to make a comeback. Okay, we're going to get England back on track. We love Bloody Mary. We were trying to wipe out those Bible believers. They just won't die. So we need to take that nation for ourselves. So Philip of Spain with this powerful Spanish Armada came over to England. And what do you know? A big wind blew off his fleet <laughs> off to the coast of Iceland. And then the majority of the fleet fell apart and his boasted most powerful Spanish Armada that could conquer worlds fell apart by just one little from God. So, so much for the famous Spanish Armada. Amen. And then Philip, that ruined the Holy Roman Empire. Their kingdom crumbled. That put England on top Amen. after that. So then the Jesuits and the Vatican were the biggest losers in history, no matter how much they tried, how much control they had. Yeah. Bible believers, they just continued on no matter what. They had over a millennia wiping us out. We carried on. God's scripture survived. Valdwalls and Waldensians memorized the scripture. God's truth marched on. Amen. Then came to the scene King James. Here is what uh, Widowson says about King James. He writes over here in page 280, A Bible translation was created that did what Luther's German Bible had done for the German language, helping to create modern English and influence, inf, uh, influencing 300 years of Christian life in the countries that spoke English. In 1603, the great English monarch and staunch Protestant who oversaw England during the time of Walter Ray, uh, Raleigh's and Francis Drake's explorations and the defeat of the Spanish Armada, Queen Elizabeth I lay dying. She was to be replaced by James Stuart of Scotland, having been king of that country since he was one years old. Both of James' parents had Tudor genes, the family of Elizabeth, but until 1586, she had not hinted that she would choose him to be her heir. This king is known by history as a man of contradictions. He has been called the Solomon of his time, the first English king with the English derivation of the Hebrew name Jacob, hence the appellation for his era of uh, Jacobean. He could read Latin and Greek and Hebrew and other languages and at a young age himself translated sacred writings between various languages, although he had no hand in the translation process of the Bible that bears his name. Some uh, good, good books that you can read about this is the King James Bible Translators by Olga Opfel, God's Secretaries by Adam Nicholson, and then the Translators Revived by Alexander McClure. All right, let's keep reading here. He had been also called God's silly vassal. He was credited by some historians as being the first English king to use the, great, uh, to use the term Great Britain, believe it or not. So that's where Great Britain came to be. He was also condemned by the Puritans for playing tennis on Sunday. He made peace with the long-standing enemy Spain. He was also accused of being a homosexual 25 years after his death by someone he had removed from his court named Weldon. Although this accusation was proven to be a lie by British historian Lady Antonia Fraser, under his watch, the colony of Jamestown was created, but also under his watch, many Puritans were kicked out of England. Finally, under his watch and with his approval, the greatest translation of the Bible in any language in any time was executed. King James VI of Scotland, who united the British crown as King James I of England was an all too much human king who left a mark on the English speaking world that is felt today. 400 years later, as many Christians still believe that the authorized version of the Bible is the word of God in English, an inspired translation or the words of God that he wants us to have in English, others disagree and don't like the translation at all, taking every opportunity they can condemn it. In 1603, he called for a meeting at Hampton Court which was actually held in January 1604 to dis discuss conflicts in the Anglican Church between the High Church Anglican bishops and the Puritans. The Puritans were separatists who desired to restore the Church of the New Testament 
and overthrow any Catholic leanings in the Church of England. They were constantly at war with the mainstream Anglicans. At the conference, one of their leaders, Dr. John Reynolds, suggested that what was needed was a new translation of the Bible that was not so prejudiced on favor of the big church people. James, surprisingly, because he hated Puritans, agreed, but put the Anglicans in charge of the project. James believed in the divine rights, right of kings and disliked the anti-authoritarian marginal, marginal notes of the popular Geneva Bible. The project was divided into six companies at various universities who would handle the translating. They were to use the Bishop's Bible and not deviate unless necessary. This didn't happen. What they did was to ignore it, and many scholars say, say they stayed 95% with Tyndale's New Testament. Once one part of the translation was finished, it would pass to the other companies who would have to approve it, and then on to the final editors who would decide all controversies. In this manner, some scholars I read insisted that each verse had to pass 14 approvals before being permitted in the final draft. The translators had every vernacular Bible in every language available in front of them. Now, for people to pick on King James to disprove the King James Bible, that's pretty lame. Yeah. You got to look at the translation itself, and you can see it went through controversy. They weren't all in one crowd agreeing with each other, and then this was like a, this was a process that had totally, if you want, uh, excuse me, peer-reviewed work, this was it right here. Had to pass 14 approvals, and then the translators had every vernacular Bible in every language in front of them. Over a thousand manuscripts, the works of Erasmus, Stephanus, and Beza, plus the Old Latin, Jerome's Vulgate, and scores of secular Greek manuscripts. For the Hebrew, they used a traditional text of the Hebrew Masorets, called the Second Great Rabbinic Bible of Jacob ben Chaim, from the famed Bomberg Publishing House. By the time they were through, they even passed their work to scholars who weren't on their committees for their suggestions, so much so that the famed Bishop Usher was asked to return the part of the Bible he was reviewing in Ireland. Yeah, the Usher, where we get the Usher's time chronology. It's the same guy. He was reviewing in Ireland so that they could finish their work. It still took seven years to complete, not being published until... <laughs> Sixteen eleven. Some other parts over here. The translators were the most brilliant minds of their age. To give you an example of their accomplishments, I will briefly discuss one of the men in charge of the translation. This guy is one of the biggest prayer warriors, actually. Lancelot Andrews. He was called the star of preachers in his day. He was able to speak over a dozen languages, and on his vacations from preaching would master a language and so learned all of the major languages of Europe plus those of the Middle East. I would like to know any of these sad, silly Calvinists today and textual critics who are amateurs and saying, what about this error in the King James Bible? Hey, fool, did, 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 you, did you know over a dozen languages? Uh, are you like this guy? This is just one of them. He so learned all the major languages of Europe, plus those of the Middle East. He was so brilliant, and like the other translators chosen, the best of the best, that Nicholson says, quote, it is because people like Lancelot Andrews flourished in the first decade of the 17th century and do not now that the greatest translation of the Bible could be made then and cannot now. Yeah. Yeah. You get a sad, silly revised version and then the NIV and now the ESV. You guys are a sad lot, man. He goes on to say that the King James Bible is the greatest creation of the 17th century. Nicholson also states that, quote, vast quantities of linguistic scholarship and skill were to be assembled on this project with scholars more than capable of teasing nuance and subtle meaning from Hebrew, Greek, and even Aramaic scripts. Olga Opfel states that, quote, altogether, the King James Bible was destined to be the product of the best and most careful scholarship of its age. There were experts in Arabic on the committee, committees, expert in architecture for the sake of understanding the tabernacle and the temple, 
experts in every field that would have some impact on studying the Bible. Opfel and Ward Allen in his The Coming of the King James Gospels and his compilation of translator John Boas's notes in translating for King James talk about some of the resources the translators use. This was to be and still is the most thorough and complete translation of the Bible using the Byzantine text of Syria and the Bibles based on it and the Hebrew of the Masoretes. Every Bible after its translation of importance, and there have been over 200 since then, has given precedence to the Alexandrian text type and the manuscripts from Egypt and a Greek translation of the Old Testament made by Origen in the 3rd century containing books rejected as canon by the Jews. That's your superior translation, huh, you fool? And you reject the King James? Of course, these points will be argued against by those who favor of the Alexandrian text. It will be pointed out that the King James translators did translate the Apocrypha, even though they placed them in between the Testaments as worthy of historical study, but not inspired literature. The evidence is, if you, you'll see the label Apocrypha on every page. But then the Old Testament, New Testament, no label. Because they see that as part of the Bible. It's kind of like in your Bible, it'll say concordance, concordance on every top of the page. Why? It's like an additional historical study note. The beliefs and attitudes of the translators can be surmised from their letter to the reader and dedicatory to King James, conspicuously absent from modern issues of the King James Bible. They viewed the Bible as being the very words of God and regarded its handling to be a sacred task. Compare this to Bible translator Philip Schaff of modern times, who in translating the American Standard Version, parent of the new American Standard Version, did not believe in divine inspiration, as did none of his translating committee. The King James translators humbly deny that their translation is superior to any other. They did not claim inspiration, but neither did Mar Matthew or Mark. Modern apologists insist that the version is a preservation of God's word, and most do not claim it. It is, it is an inspired translation. The appellation of authorized version was not applied until later due to this Bible replacing all others as the standard English Bible. Although King James did authorize it to be read in the churches, it was not the only Bible in circulation. Just as later, the Greek text it was based on, called the Textus Receptus, or Received Text, was given its name by common usage uh, of the term, so did this Bible become known as the Authorized Version, yeah. until the 20th century advertising campaigns of other Bibles began referring it as the KJV, or KJB, giving it the same three-letter distinction as its competition. Yeah. With printing being a bulky, tedious task, there were several editions containing printing errors which had to be corrected. Spelling wasn't standardized until the mid-1700s, and the King James Bible used today is different in that regard to the non-standardized spelling of 1611. Yeah. With nearly a billion King James Bibles having been printed, it created our language, and you can't help but quote it with phrases like, making a difference, or escaped with the skin of my teeth, being direct references, as well as many others in our language. Amen. William Phelps, professor of English literature at Yale, you know what he said in his book, Human Nature and the Bible? We Anglo-Saxons have a better Bible than the French or the Germans or the Italians or the Spanish. Our English translation is even better than the original Hebrew and Greek. It was Ruckman who said what? No, Ruckman didn't start that. Scholars, modern scholars, they don't read. There is only one way to explain this. I have no theory to account for the so-called inspiration of the Bible, but I am confident that the authorized version was inspired. How about that? Now, as the English-speaking people have the... This is him continuing his quote. Now, as the English-speaking people have the best Bible in the world, and as it is the most beautiful monument ever erected with the English alphabet, Amen. we ought to make the most of it, for it is an incomparably rich inheritance, free to all who can read. This means that we ought invariably in the church and on public occasions to use the authorized version. All others are inferior. Amen. 
and except for special purposes, it should be used exclusively in private reading. Amen. Why make constant companions of the second best when the best is available? Yeah. Let's close with the word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the word of God that we hold in our hands. And I pray that the next part of our history will be excited even more. Uh, as we see the King James Bible being attacked by the Jesuits at, during the translation process of the King James Bible, I will explain that in our next history study. May we open our eyes and see truly, truly what an amazing history we have and that the enemy is still that mother church in Rome, Lord. How easy. Isn't it amazing, Father? People say America is Babylon. Isn't that what the liberals wanted anyway, to make sure that America becomes the enemy while we embrace the whole world? Isn't that strange, Father? Isn't Babylon supposed to be the Roman Catholic whore? How well has she hit herself? May we never forget our enemy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.